I invite you to open your Bibles to John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45, is where we will start for our study this morning. John 6, 44. In our Bible class this morning, we were talking about the Spirit and the Word, and we used that time to notice passages of Scripture that help us to understand how the Holy Spirit operates and works in the world today and in our lives today, how he saves people from sin and how he helps the Christian to stay saved. And what we noticed is that everything that the New Testament tells us that the Holy Spirit does, it also tells us that that's what the Word of God does. And that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God are the same thing, but it does mean that the Holy Spirit works by means of the Bible, that that's what he uses to do all of the things that he does. The Holy Spirit does not operate on man directly today, but he works indirectly through the scriptures, through the word of God. And we looked at a lot of verses that help us to see that, that this is how the Holy Spirit works. And I want us to take that foundation and build on it and to ask the question, how does the Holy Spirit save? How does he save men today? The religious world gives us many different answers to a question of that sort. And some say it's a direct operation where he removes inherited sin and uh, saves us by, by operating on our heart. Others say that it's through Holy Spirit baptism and his power comes upon us and the different various ideas that the religious world has. But the New Testament teaches us very clearly how the Holy Spirit saves men. And obviously, he does, just as God the Father and God the Son are involved in man's salvation, so is the Holy Spirit. But how does that happen? Well, the New Testament teaches us. For example, here in John 6 and verse 44, Jesus says, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And I know we've mentioned this before, but it's worth noting again that many in the religious world will read that verse and stop there and say that you cannot be saved, you can't come to Jesus unless the Father draws you to him. And the way they say the Father draws us is by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will move you, that he'll cause you to feel something, that some miraculous or some supernatural or some emotional way that he'll pull on your heartstrings and draw you to Jesus so you can be saved. And the problem with that way of thinking is that it's just not what the Bible teaches. The very next verse, Jesus explains how the Father draws us. He says, it is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. So Jesus says, you can't come to me unless the Father draws you. And then he says, all those who have heard and learned of the Father come to me. So that explains to us how we are drawn to Jesus, how the Father draws us. He does it through the word. When we hear the truth and we learn of the Father and we learn of his love for us and we learn of Jesus and his role as our Savior, that draws us to him. And there's nothing miraculous about that. It's God working by means of his word. And that same principle applies to the Holy Spirit. God has chosen to save man by the preaching of the gospel, by the teaching of his word, through the agency of men. Men preach and teach God's word. People hear it and believe it and obey it, and they are saved. And God does the saving. It's, it's him. It's all in his hands. But he does it through his word, through his servants. The Great Commission is given in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. 
Jesus is with them. He is responsible for saving man, but he does it through the preaching of the gospel, making disciples by teaching the truth. Mark 16, 15, and 16. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So again, salvation comes through the preaching of the gospel. When men hear it and believe it and obey it. Who saves them? The Lord does, but he does it by means of the word. And I want us to take that idea and go to the book of Acts. And we're going to spend some time this morning going through some of the accounts of conversion in the book of Acts. And noticing the role of God and especially the Holy Spirit in the conversion of of men. And it's one of the key things that the book of Acts does for us is to record how this this message, this good news about Jesus, how it goes out into the world, but also what God expects from it. When people hear it, how do they respond to it? So we start in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 says, Now when uh, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice that they were cut to the heart. Again, people often talk about the Holy Spirit affecting our hearts and our emotions and moving us to do things. Well, he does that, but he doesn't do it directly. He does it through the word. When they heard that they had crucified the Son of God, it cut them to the heart. The Holy Spirit was cutting them. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God, according to Ephesians 6. And that sword was being used to pierce their hearts over the sins that they'd committed. So they were moved by the truth. And they asked, what shall we do? And of course, Peter told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now skip down in that chapter to verse 40. It says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So who were saved on the day of Pentecost? Those who gladly received his words. Which words? The words that Peter preached recorded in that sermon. The words that the other apostles preached on that day that are not recorded in this chapter. And the many other words that he testified and exhorted teaching them God's word. When they heard scripture, they heard the truth of God, they believed it and they obeyed it, and that's when they were saved. Where did that word come from? When you go back to the beginning of the chapter, we were reminded that the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak with other tongues. The Holy Spirit gave them the words to say. So the Holy Spirit was responsible for every conversion on the day of Pentecost. But he did it not by Holy Spirit baptism. That only came on the apostles. The way everyone else was saved on the day of Pentecost was through the preaching of those apostles and their accepting the truth of their words. And so the church began, souls began to be saved by the gospel of Christ. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 4, we see the church growing and multiplying. And notice again that it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So you had about 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, and now you have 5,000, and this is just the number of men, not counting women. But what did they do? They heard the word, and they believed it. So again, it's the Holy Spirit working through the word to save souls. Chapter 6 of Acts, and verse number 7. Here we're told, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So you have 3,000, then you have 5,000, only the men. And now you have a great company of priests, which is a, a large number of Jews who were of the tribe of Levi, who were priests under that Old Testament system, have been converted. But also we're told that the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. 
So and that's not just times two, you know, that's times four or times eight, however many it is. But the numbers are, are getting large here of those who are becoming Christians, disciples of Christ. And why is that? Verse 7 says, because the word of God increased. Now, that may have to do with the fact that God was revealing, you know, truth and more of it was re being revealed. But I don't think that's what it means. When it says the word of God increased, it means there were more people teaching it. Because the number of, of Christians, of disciples, had grown, there were more people going out into the city, into the community, teaching the gospel. And that's how it's supposed to be. When a congregation grows, there are supposed to be more evangelists, more Christians who go out and teach others. And sometimes we miss that, and we think it's only a select few, or the preacher, or the elders, or whoever, who do the evangelizing. But every Christian is an evangelist, and that's what they were doing. That's why the church grew but it's through the preaching of the word now go to chapter 8 of acts in verse number 12 philip goes to the city of samaria and verse 12 says but when they believed philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of god and the name of jesus christ they were baptized both men and women so notice they believed what philip was preaching and he was preaching about the kingdom, which is the church. He was preaching about the name of Jesus, which is the authority of Jesus, that he is the Christ. And he preached baptism because they knew to be baptized. And so they became Christians, disciples of Christ. Hadn't been called Christians yet, but followers of Jesus. But notice verse 13. It says, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So those miracles and signs that Philip was performing were from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was using those to confirm that what Philip was telling them was the truth. And so they had Simon the sorcerer present, and Simon was doing tricks, and he was using, you know, illusion, magic we might call it, to deceive people until they saw a real miracle. And when Philip came with the power of the Holy Spirit and did these wonders, the people recognized very clearly who was telling them the truth and who had been lying to them. In fact, Simon himself recognized it, and because of that, he became a believer. He did the same thing that all those others did. He believed and he was baptized. And according to what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, that means he was saved. So the Holy Spirit was working here, but he was working through miracles to confirm what was being taught was the truth. He wasn't directly operating on the heart of anyone. Now look at verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now we understand that what's happening here is that the apostles are imparting miraculous abilities to these new Christians, new, new converts. So they've obeyed the gospel. The apostles come down and lay hands on them to give them the ability to work miracles. But what's important to notice is that verse 16 says the Holy Spirit had not fallen upon them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, there are some in the denominational world who say, well, they'd only been baptized in the Lord Jesus, but they didn't have Holy Spirit baptism yet, so they, they, were, they were Christians, but they weren't born-again Christians. They had to have both of those things. And that's a misunderstanding of what's being said here. The point is that they had obeyed the gospel, they had their sins forgiven, they were saved, they were disciples. If they died at that moment, they would have gone to eternal life in heaven because they had heard and believed and obeyed the gospel without the Holy Spirit doing anything to them directly. The Holy Spirit hadn't operated on their heart. He hadn't fallen upon any of them. All they had done was to hear and obey the gospel. And that's all that they needed as far as salvation was concerned. The miraculous gifts were so when they taught others, they could prove that what they were saying was the truth because this book hadn't been written yet. 
It was in the process of being revealed. Once it was completed, you no longer need the miracles. If we want to know if, it, if what someone says is true, all we have to do is look at the book. We don't need them to do a miracle. But concerning their salvation, they didn't need any direct power from the Holy Spirit. They only needed the power in the word that was preached and that was taught to them. And that's what they had heard, and that's how they were saved. Now, skip down to verse 26 in this chapter. Philip has been in Samaria, and now, verse 26 says, The angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And so we know that he's going to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch, the, the nobleman, the treasurer. Verse 29 says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Why didn't the Spirit just go directly to the eunuch and save him from his sins? Operate directly on his heart, remove his guilt, and, and make him a believer in the Word of God. Because that's not how the Holy Spirit works. And that's not God's plan in saving man. It's to be done through the preaching of the gospel. So the Spirit was involved, but he told Philip to go to the chariot and to preach. And that's what Philip did. Verse 30, he ran thither to him, heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And the Bible says that Philip started at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Verse 35, he began where the Ethiopian was in the word of God, and he preached to him Jesus. Verse 36 says, As they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How did he know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Did the Holy Spirit reveal it to him? He did, but not directly and not miraculously. The Holy Spirit revealed it through the preaching of Philip, who was teaching the Word of God. And that's the way the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to us today, through the Scripture. If I want to know that Jesus is the Son of God, I don't have to wait for the Holy Spirit to lay it on my heart or to speak to me in a vision or a dream. All I have to do is read His book. That's what He's given it to us for. And if I do that, I can know the same truth that the Ethiopian knew, that those on the day of Pentecost knew, and I can obey that same gospel and be just what they were, Christians. Nothing more nothing less. So verse 38 says, he commanded the chariot to stand still. They went down into the water, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Look at chapter 9 now in verse number 3. Saul of Tarsus, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Saul, just accept me as your personal Savior, and you'll be saved from your sins. The Lord said, Saul, I appeared to you in a vision. That means you're already saved from your sin. That's not what the Lord said. The Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee, what thou must do. Why didn't the Lord just tell him what he needed to do? Why does he have to go to the city? And why does he have to wait for three days? And why does Ananias have to come and preach the gospel to him? Because that's the way God has determined for men to be saved today, through the preaching of his word, not by his direct action upon anyone. So the Lord himself appeared to Saul and told him to go in the city and a man would come and tell him what to do to be saved. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Ananias came, Acts twenty two sixteen says that he said to Saul, and now why tarriest thou? Meaning, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Lord said he would tell him what he must do and Ananias told him what he must do to be saved. He needed to get up and he needed to be baptized in order to have his sins washed away. So the Lord was involved in Saul's salvation, but not directly, 
always through the word and those who preach and who teach it. Look at chapter 10 and down at the end of that chapter uh, in the story of Cornelius. Verse 44 says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So Peter is sent to the house of Cornelius. And there's an angel involved and there's a vision involved and all of those things. And he comes to Cornelius' household and he begins to preach to him the gospel. And verse 44 tells us that while Peter was speaking those words, <coughs> excuse me, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. Notice they're hearing the word. To understand what took place here, when Peter comes back to report to the apostles and to tell them what happened at Cornelius' household, he, he gives the details in order in the order which these things happen. And that's recorded for us in chapter 11. So if you look at chapter 11 and verse 13, he says, I'm sorry, verse 12, he says, the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Notice the Holy Spirit told Peter to go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Now, notice, before we read a little further, that the Holy Spirit was involved, but he didn't go directly to Cornelius and operate on his heart to save him from his sins. He didn't go directly to Cornelius to tell him what to do to be saved. Instead, the Holy Spirit told Peter to go to Cornelius so Peter could preach the gospel to him and tell him what to do to be saved. So what about the Holy Ghost falling on them? Well, in verse uh, 14, he, Peter said, Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved? Saved by words. That's the gospel. And then he says in verse 15, And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. That's important to understand that Peter says it was as he began to speak. It wasn't that he had preached the gospel to them and they'd heard all the truth about Jesus and they knew who he was and then the Holy Ghost fell on them and saved them from their sins. It was when he began to speak because the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon Cornelius' household had nothing to do with their salvation at all. It was a sign to Peter that God had accepted the Gentiles and God wanted him to preach to these individuals so they could be saved. They weren't saved through the power of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon them. They were saved when they heard words and they believed them and obeyed them. So Peter says, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said... John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift where, as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. You see, they understood that the outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit was to confirm that God accepted the Gentiles and he wanted the gospel to be preached to them. But Cornelius and his family still had to hear the sermon. They had, had to hear the words whereby they would be saved. And it was upon hearing those words that they obeyed the gospel. If you notice back in chapter 10 and verse 46, uh, it says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Why would they need to be baptized in the name of the Lord if they had already received Holy Spirit baptism and Holy Spirit baptism saved them from their sins? The answer is that Holy Spirit baptism did not save them from their sins. It never was about salvation from sin. It was about being a sign so people would know that God was with these individuals. God was allowing the gospel to go to the Gentiles. So even though they had received this power from the Holy Spirit, they still needed to be saved. 
they still needed to be baptized. And that's why Peter preached to them and why they obeyed and they were baptized. That seems confusing to us. It seems a little backwards because that idea is so taught in the religious world that Holy Spirit baptism was about salvation, but it never was. It was always a sign from God, and that's what was taking place here. A couple more examples real quickly. Go to chapter 16 and verse 14 in the story of Lydia and her conversion. The Bible says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. So notice that they preached the gospel to Lydia. Lydia was a Jew. A Jewish woman, she uh, already believed in God and she worshipped God. And so when the gospel was preached to her, we're told that her heart was opened by the Lord. That she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. And again, the religious world says, you see, the Lord had to open her heart so she could hear the gospel. And they get things backward. What actually happened is she heard the gospel and the Lord opened her heart. Her heart was open to the Lord because she's already a worshiper of God. She was already willing to hear God's word, and it was through the preaching of the word that her heart was truly um, open. And so she was baptized. She obeyed the gospel. Also in this chapter at verse 29, the Bible says about the Philippian jailer, Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas, And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and his, all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So you notice with Lydia... The key to her salvation was hearing the word of the Lord and attending to the things that were spoken. The same is true with the Philippian jailer. He had seen, you know, the the wonders of the earthquake and the prison doors being opened and all of those things. And he he was afraid. And he asked, what must I do to be saved? The answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, our friends in the religious world like to stop right there and think that that's all you have to do to be saved. Just believe on the Lord Jesus. The truth of the matter is, just like in all these cases of conversion, the person preaching starts where the individual hearing is. So, for example, with Lydia, she was already a believer in God and a worshiper of God. So you didn't have to preach to her about God. You could start where she was and then talk about Jesus. Here with the Philippian jailer, this man is a Gentile. He doesn't know anything about anything concerning God and and true religion. So you have to start with the basics, and the basic is belief. It has to start with faith. On the day of Pentecost, you had people who already were were Jews and who already believed God, and through Peter's sermon, they had come to understand that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. They knew that. That's why they were saying, what must we do? Because we killed the Son of God. They had faith. They were ready for repentance. And so he told them, repent and be baptized. This man doesn't have faith yet. And so he asked, what must I do to be saved? Well, you have to believe in Jesus. That's where you start. And so he started and preached to him Jesus. But where did we end up? The same place that all of these stories end up with baptism. And notice that the Bible says and makes it very clear in verse 33 that he was baptized. And verse uh, 34 says that he rejoiced believing in God with all his house. He was told to believe in God, but he's not said to be believing in God until he was baptized, until he obeyed the gospel, because faith without works is dead. But the key here is that it was all through the preaching of the gospel. Did the Holy Spirit save Lydia? Did the Holy Spirit save the Philippian jailer? Of course he did. But he did it not directly, but indirectly through the teaching of Scripture. In Acts 17 and verse 10, 
The Bible says the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women which were Greeks, and of men not a few. Therefore they believed. Why? Because they searched the scriptures. They listened to the word of God, they studied the word of God, and that's why they believed. So they obeyed the gospel because they'd heard the teaching of scripture. The Holy Spirit saved them through the word. Acts 18 and verse 8 says, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. And that's the order. Hearing leads to believing, which leads to obeying. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the Holy Spirit saved them when they heard and believed and obeyed. Not directly, but indirectly. And one last example in Acts chapter 19 and verse number 5, the Ephesians. The Bible says when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul they laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. So notice, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They heard they obeyed and they were saved. And then Paul laid hands on them and gave them the Holy Ghost, the miraculous abilities that the Holy Spirit provided. Was the Holy Spirit involved in their conversion or just in the miraculous abilities? Both. But their conversion took place when they heard and believed and obeyed. He always works through the Word of God when it comes to saving souls from sin. And the reason for this is Romans 1.16. Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The power of God unto salvation is not the direct working of the Holy Spirit on the heart of man. Doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is not involved in our salvation, but his power is directed through the gospel. That is God's power to save. And any person who is going to be saved from his or her sins, the only way that can ever be possible is through hearing and believing and obeying the gospel of Christ. Now, when you do that, God saves you. Jesus saves you. The Holy Spirit saves you. But they don't do it directly. It's always by means of of the word. And that's how God has ordered things in this New Testament age. Over in the book of James chapter 1 and verse 18, James says, "Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures." Notice that we are begotten by the word of truth. That has to do with the new birth. It's the seed taking root in our hearts and producing fruit. But that seed, Luke 8, 11, is the word of God. And that's how God begets us. Begetting is the process of giving new life. Also here in James 1, verse 21, he says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. It's the word of God when it's engrafted into us that begets us, starts that new life within us, and saves our souls. That's the power of God's word. 2 Peter 1 and verse number 3 reminds us of this truth. Peter says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and and virtue. God's divine power is in his word. The knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of salvation activates the power of God in our hearts. That's the way that God has chosen to work. So the Holy Spirit saves sinners by the gospel of Christ that is preached by Christians. 
That's the way that it's worked since the day of Pentecost, and that's the way that it will continue to work until the Lord returns. You and I are to be the preachers. We go out seeking good soil, honest hearts, to plant the seed of God's word in that souls can hear and believe and obey and become Christians, disciples of Jesus. I want to close by reminding us of a couple of things that the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit does and how it shows us uh, the means that he uses to accomplish these things. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit speaks. But verse 6 says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of the, these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. Notice the Spirit speaks, but it was up to Timothy to put the brethren in remembrance of those things. The Holy Spirit spoke through Timothy. Now Timothy, of course, had miraculous abilities and was inspired, but today the Holy Spirit speaks through men when we read the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is still speaking but he does it through his word and the teaching and the preaching of the gospel. The Holy Spirit saves, but as we just read there in James chapter 1, it's the engrafted word that saves our soul. Titus 3 and verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost saves us. How? through the word that speaks to our hearts that we believe and that we obey. And one last thing, the Bible ends by reminding us in Revelation 22:17 that the Holy Spirit calls us. He issues that great invitation. The Spirit and the bride say, "Come. Come unto me," Jesus said. Well, the Holy Spirit also says, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. The Holy Spirit calls us to come unto him. But according to 2 Thessalonians 2.14, he called us by his gospel. If you want the Holy Spirit, if you're waiting for him to do something, to speak to you, to influence you, to guide you or direct you to salvation... All you have to do is open this book and read it. He is calling to you through his word. And that's all that we ask of anyone. That's all that the Lord asks of anyone. It's just to be open to the truth of scripture, to hear it with an honest heart, believe it and obey it. Because it is the word of God. It is the word of Jesus. It is the word of the Holy Spirit. And this is how they call you and me to salvation. Do you need to answer that call? If so, there's an opportunity before you at this very moment to be obedient to the gospel of Christ, not to respond to the preacher or respond to the elders or to respond to a congregation, but to respond to the Lord, to answer the Spirit's call and give your life to Jesus in complete submission and obedience to his will. Simply do what he says and what all these that we've read about did. They heard the word, they believed it, they repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Jesus, and they were baptized for the remission of sins. If you'll do what they did, you'll be what they were, a Christian saved on your way to eternal life in heaven. If you've done those things but haven't been faithful, the Spirit continues to call. He wants you to come back home to again have the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life in heaven. He calls us to repent, to confess our wrongs, to ask for forgiveness, and God promises to forgive and to restore. If you need to answer that call, we'll help you do that in any way that we can. Just let it be known by coming forward, even now as we stand and as we sing.